My name is Morrison Heckscher, and I'm the chairman of the American Wing, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's Saturday at the Met, celebrating the new American Wing. For those of you in interested in American paintings, for the next two years until the reopening of the picture galleries in 2011, I urge you to look in the loose center of the American Wing and in the Lehman, collection, uh, Lehman Pavilion for many of our masterpieces which are actually on display at this time. But for those interested in American decorative arts and architecture and American sculpture, the newly opened Charles Engelhard Court and the full series of our period rooms from 17th century to New England to 20th century uh, uh, Midwest are what we are really celebrating today. It's my great pleasure to introduce my distinguished colleague and friend, uh, Beth Weiss, uh, who will be the first speaker and also the, the uh, uh, maitre d' for the rest of this, this afternoon. Beth is a graduate of Smith uh, with an MA in uh, art history from Williams. And for a number of years, she was the distinguished curator of decorative arts at the Clark In Art Institute in Williamstown. Uh, uh, during that time, she curated a superb collection of English silver and published one of the definitive uh, 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 collection catalogs of English silver anywhere in the world. In 2000, the year 2000, uh, she became an acquisition of the Metropolitan Museum. And we are pleased to have her as the American Decorative Arts Curator of, of metals, particularly silver. Um, she is going to be talking about uh, the reinstallation of uh, the decorative arts uh, in the Charles Engelhard Court. And she is going to introduce a number of uh, assistant and associate uh, research assistants uh, in the American wing who have done yeoman service uh, and are often not on stage to receive the credit they should for the research and uh, all the hard work that goes into an installation such as we have just uh, completed in the American wing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Beth Weiss. Thank you, Maury, and welcome, everyone. It's lovely to have you all here on such a beautiful day. I should think you'd rather be outside. Let's see. Here we go. When the Engelhart Court first opened in June of 1980 as a floor-to-ceiling, glassed-in garden court, it was hailed for ex its extraordinary spaciousness, flooded with sunlight, as you can see in this image, and lush with greenery. A reflecting pool in the front, you can see it in the front, anchored the south end, and live ficus trees filled the interior, and you see them here framing the entrance to uh, Martin E. Thompson's 1824 Branch Bank of the United States, the facade, which was originally located at 15 and a half Wall Street. And then along with Tiffany, uh, Louis Tiffany's uh, spectacular loggia, which doesn't show in this image, uh, which was designed around 1905 for his country estate at um, Laurelton Hall. Those two architectural elements still prov provide the setting of, of each end of the great courtyard. Evergreens and densely planted beds bordered the sky-high vertical columns that you see on each side. And examples of the museum's outstanding collection of American sculpture were installed amidst the plantings, almost as if they were uh, garden ornaments. And high above this verdant scene, at the clear story level, let's see if I can make this, uh, I think there's a, up here, were um, two balconies, actually a wraparound balcony that ran along three sides of the courtyard, uh, bordered by these tall masonry walls that obscured the view of whatever might have been up there. And in fact, at first, nothing was, so just as well. However, over the course of the next year, glass-sided display cases were installed with one of America's finest collections of American ceramics, glass, silver, and pewter, some 600 objects in all, dating from the 17th century to the early 20th century, centuries. And here you see a view, um, as it was, of the East Balcony depicting these walk-around uh, cases, here filled with stoneware and redware, 
all of it installed according to medium in a roughly chronological sequence. These rectangular display cases uh, stood on short, sturdy brass legs. You see them here, you'll see them again. And um, the, uh, the decks of each of these were uh, fabric covered and the shelves were fabric covered as well, here and here. And then blocks were installed to support the decorative arts objects. Then hidden up here above uh, at the top, um, above these moldings, were, was the light source to illuminate the, the cases. On the west side, where we are now, overlooking Central Park, silver and pewter held court with uh, colonial examples installed at the north end down here, and then leading to, uh, all the way to the 19th century, where objects such as Tiffany and Company's uh, wonderful um, uh, vase that was presented to William Cullen Bryant on the occasion of his 80th birthday, um, it, it, which still stands on the balcony, but in, in a different location, um, all sort of crowded into these glass display cases. Along the masonry wall on the east and west, uh, excuse me, on the masonry wall on the east and the window wall overlooking Central Park on the west, rail cases with opaque or translucent backs held additional examples of these decorative arts, such as the art glass uh, displayed here, uh, that you see on the east side and colonial silver and pewter on the west. So this gives you an image of what we started with uh, when we began our reinstallation plans. By the start of the 21st century, when I arrived at the Met, the ficus trees had passed on and were replaced by smaller trees. A tall lattice work um, trellis, I don't know if you can make it out in this slide, was installed on either side, uh, extending this garden theme for the courtyard. And the museum's superb collection of small decorative arts remained on view, albeit often unnoticed, high up here on the balconies, where they were discovered by the intrepid collector, keen, um, someone with keen interest, or perhaps by the occasional visitor who stumbled upon them uh, with, you know, through serendipity. In the summer of 2003, I was interviewed by Dana Tyler of New York's WCBS TV station about the Met's collection of American silver, which she aired in a segment of her um, weekly Sunday morning series, CBS Two at the Met. I shared with Dana my concern about um, help, helping visitors to find the collection, and she replied, no problem, I'll just tell everyone how easy it is to find. If you haven't been to this part of the museum before, it's really easy to find. We're in the American wing, the Englehart Court, up on the balcony with Central Park as the backdrop. And right here you'll see 250 years of American silver making history. <laughs> as plans began to, to sh take shape for the renovated American wing, Guided by Chairman Maury Heckscher's vision for increased transparency and easier navigation, we sought ways to bring the balcony uh, cases into this mix. The curatorial staff charged with overseeing the courtyard renovations uh, was chaired by um, our colleague Alice Cooney Freelingheisen, known to many of you as Nani, and also included Thayer Tolls and myself. We've wor worked first with the architectural firm of Roche Dinkaloo, and then later with one of the Met's uh, in-house designers, M Michael Lapthorne, to create what we hoped would be an airier, lighter, more visible display with a clearer narrative than we had had with the objects installed simply by medium. One of our first questions, of course, was, were those walls, were those masonry walls, uh, uh, um, the other one, structural, or could they actually be moved? Could they be, re be replaced, for instance, by transparent glass walls? And as that discussion unfolded, Maury Heckscher began to embrace another idea. What about adding a second balcony below the first in all of this space to give us additional display space? By doing so, we would gain approximately 3,000 square feet of space, as well as an, an additional entrance into the Henry R. Luce Study Center, which not everyone was finding as they came to the wing. And this was all part of this whole idea of making it uh, an easier navigation, making it easier for people to navigate. In this architectural rendering, the proposed scheme was sketched out 
uh, for the staff's approval. And I think you can see that the increased clarity and transparency was immediately exhilarating for us. In this new plan, the courtyard floor would be leveled and the plantings drastically reduced, allowing the sculpture uh, to gain its long overdue primacy in, in this uh, sculpture court. Monumental re relief sculptures by Daniel Chester French, which had formerly been up here on the balcony, and I'm gonna show you another picture, are now um, placed below uh, where they make much more sense with, um, with the other sculpture. And stained glass windows, which had been either, well, this is a brand new one, but had been uh, installed along here on, on other, in other aspects of the um, courtyard, were moved up to the balcony where they made much more sense in terms of uh, the material on the balcony. The new mezzanine level um, would be installed overlooking Central Park and would enable us to exhibit additional stained glass windows as well. I don't know if you can make them out in here. Um, and take advantage of the natural light coming out of Central Park. And additionally, a new glass staircase would be installed to help visitors navigate from the upper balcony to the mezzanine level or vice versa. It all looked so easy in the drawing but the work was just beginning. And for, I show you here first the um, incredible uh, uh, moving of the Daniel Chester French sculptures from their original location here to be removed eventually down here. Uh, at this point, they would, be, they would be stored for safekeeping while we endured a teeth rattling, anxiety producing big dig of our own as the floor of um, the Engelhardt Court was removed and uh, we excavated down 18 feet of, as Maury says, solid Manhattan schist. Uh, but in doing so, the Metropolitan Museum gained 10,000 square feet of additional facility space uh, without having to expand either out or up. And this was key. So this basement level is currently being um, readied for various museum services in, in need of additional um, space. The Engelhardt Court's architectural elements and the glass display cases that we were looking at a moment ago were securely wrapped in advance of the drilling and they remained under cover uh, as the excavation proceeded and the new marble flooring was installed. Yet even in these early photographs uh, of the work, um, we were able to uh, see what would be, and it was thrilling. It was um, very exciting to be able to see the cases from the courtyard, to be able to look up and know what was up there, and um, to envision what would, what would happen. It was a long wait, over two years duration, but while this was all taking place, Nani uh, Frielinghuysen and I, assisted by our incomparable um, colleagues, research associate Medill Higgins Harvey and research assistant Adrian Spinozzi, prepared mock-ups of, of each new case installation. And here's Medill now serving as a plate stand uh, as we began to mock up. We have 54 cases in all on both balconies now, and each one had to have a um, special uh, mock-up preparation so that we would know um, what we were going to do uh, when the cases were actually ready for us. In this, we were aided enormously by our designer, Ma Michael Lapthorne, whom you see here in the dark jacket, um, with one of the installers, Fred Sager. I'll be talking about them in, uh, in a moment. Michael's um, creativity, but particularly his calm demeanor, was uh, key in getting us through this very long process. And of course, the ever fabulous American Wing technicians. Um, let's see if I can help you out here. That's um, Don Templeton, Sean Farrell, Chad Lemke, and uh, Dennis Kaiser, uh, patiently ferried the 1,000 objects that we eventually installed in and out of storage as we needed them. Members of the objects conservation staff were also essential to our planning, since many of the objects we were going to put back on view needed treatment, repair, or cleaning. And I would especially like to acknowledge uh, conservator Linda Borsch, whom you see here on the screen at work on George Gray Barnard's Two Natures in Man. She's also a sculpture con um, conservator as well as small decorative arts. And Linda has been ex an extraordinary ally in helping us um, prepare for installation and reach this goal, and she continues to do so. And her associate, um, Ann Grady, will be speaking to you very soon about the conservation of two um, important pieces of silver in our collection. In the final weeks, members of the installation staff worked their magic, uh, vir creating virtually invisible and 
more importantly, safe and secure mounts um, to uh, hold objects onto in various ways. And here you see in the foreground installer, Jenna Wainwright and Fred Sager working with Adrian Spinozzi um, on a truly amazing case of mold blown glass bottles, uh, which appear to float, uh, whoops, excuse me, I'm gonna lose them, uh, float um, against the backdrop of Central Park. Now, how do you get up there without Dana Tyler telling you? Now you can access the balconies in a number of ways. You can still take the Louis Sullivan staircase. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture to show you at the, at the south end of the courtyard. But you can also take the American Wing's new glass elevator, which is located at the north end, uh, adjacent to John Lafarge's welcome window, which has recently been relocated to welcome you as you approach. You climb aboard and press number two for the second floor ride it up, get out, and uh, when you exit the elevator, which you would do on this side, you simply walk around through the um, pair of glass doors onto the east side of the balcony. Now you will recall that in its earlier iteration, the east balcony displayed ceramics and glass arranged strictly by medium in display cases with flat fabric rack, wrap decks and supported on rather stout um, brass legs. Those cases have now been completely refurbished, fitted with new bases, with sloped label decks, wrapped in a neutral uh, ultra suede. And instead of the um, fabric wrapped upper uh, decks, we now have glass, which adds to the transparency and also does not cause a dark shadow in the area underneath as the old cases did. The arrangement is no longer entirely by medium, but it's rather an integrated chronological mixture of silver, ceramics, glass, and other metals. And in some instances, and I don't know if you can make it out here, um, as in this case right here, we have um, combined media of uh, different materials, but similar date, uh, which um, by, by doing, uh, I'm look, I've gotten myself into a bad sentence. By doing this, we were able to um, tell more of a story of how these objects related stylistically, culturally, or uh, thematically. I was very pleased when we had, uh, got the review by ha Holland Cotter in the New York Times that he called this mixture, he termed it, that it was giving, uh, creating visual texture, which I think is a wonderful way to describe it. We begin on the east side with 17th and 18th century silver, celebrating the beauty and craftsmanship of our earliest silversmiths. Many of these objects um, reflect a, a strong influence of old world uh, styles and techniques, um, as here in a case of 18th century uh, silver objects made in Boston and New York. And of course, it, there is no surprise about this, since most of our earliest silversmiths were either born or trained abroad or learned their craft from immigrant masters uh, who had made their way to this country. The importation of luxury goods is a story told in this case, uh, which has a number of mixed media. These are precious objects imported from England, France, China, all owned uh, and used in this country and underscoring the continuation of traditions um, here as well as the age old desire to follow current fashions to keep up with, with current trends. As you traverse the balcony, you will encounter a variety of display aesthetics, if you will, often related to the style of that period. So for instance, in this case, we have an arrangement of neoclassical silver whose rather spare, elegant lines inspired a, a rather spare presentation. And here you will find teapots by the uh, celebrated, famous um, Patriot silversmith Paul Revere, Jr who also made this slender um, and very dignified hot water urn, one of only a handful known uh, by 18th century American silversmiths. And I show you this partly because it's such a wonderful photograph taken by one of our um, Met photographers, Bruce Schwarz, where it's silhouetted against the airiness of the courtyard and I think really um, underscores the light and uh, spaciousness that we have now achieved. Other case arrangements are far more intense as for instance, this deliciously rich display of Pennsylvania redware whose massing I think really enhances the liveliness of the objects. This was the combined vision of Nani Frelinghuysen and our designer Michael Lapthorne and with the technical prowess of our installers, of our ins installation staff, I think produced one of the most exciting um, new cases on the balcony. 
One of my own favorite pairings are these two cases, which, although we knew would be installed nearby, close to one another, I think in, in the doing, in the seeing, um, really uh, pleased us all greatly. You have here um, uh, late neoclassical silver in the foreground and uh, neoclassical and Rococo revival porcelain behind. Um, and here, I think the, the various spouts and handles and embossed ornament really speak uh, effortlessly to one another. And these are the kinds of new discoveries you'll make when you revisit the collection. As you round the midpoint of the balcony with the facade of the branch bank directly before you, you'll encounter these three mid-19th century oil lamps uh, in a patriotic palette of red, white, and blue. And you would also find them if you entered the American wing from the European paintings galleries. You leave a gallery full of Rembrandts, open the door, and there you find red, white, and blue oil lamps against the, the facade of the branch bank. Um, and I think you'll certainly know that you have arrived in the new world. And just around the corner, positioned to take full advantage of the glorious light from Central Park, is this case of colorful blown mold glass on which you saw the installers working just a few moments ago. Although much of this glass has been on view for many years, on the east side of the balcony, uh, it has never looked so well. And I think the opportunity to rearrange the collection by taking advantage of, of such uh, effects, as well as to be able to offer our visitors a more compelling narrative, has been one of the greatest delights of this project for those of us on the curatorial staff involved with um, these small objects. While most of the display cases on the balcony were refurbished, several new ones have been added, bringing to to uh, the total to 41 cases on the upper balcony on the second floor and another 13 new, brand new cases on the mezzanine level below. And this has enabled us to display almost 400 more objects than were originally displayed in, uh, when the, when the um, Englehart Court opened in 1981. And I'm not showing you everything, but you can see that there, there is certainly something for everyone, depending on what, uh, what interests you. So what else is new? The excitement over our reinstallation has been shared by a number of our uh, most dedicated supporters who have come forward with an extraordinary um, outpouring of loans and gifts. And in this case, which features silver of the aesthetic movement, that is, objects dating from the 1870s and 1880s, it includes a large number of loans from a private collection. Among them are extraordinary examples of the mixed metal wares manufactured by Tiffany and Company. For instance, this marvelous uh, um, chocolate pot, uh, in rare, a rare, very rare object in copper and silver um, with a striking red patina and ornamented with such indescribable uh, um, uh, uh, creatures as crabs and lobsters cast in silver and soldered on the side. How they happen to be on a chocolate pot is beyond me, but it's, it's a fabulous object. The two-year period dur during which renovations to the courtyard and balconies took place also offered us a unique opportunity to study and clean a number of objects, uh, and many important objects uh, in the collection, such as the magnolia vase on the screen now, made by Tiffany and Company as the centerpiece for their uh, display at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition. And here it is as it looks today, and in just a moment you will hear Anne Grady uh, speaking on how it, uh, how it got to this point. Um, it didn't look like this uh, a year ago. And likewise, the gold and jeweled Adams vase back here, shown in a, a mixed media case um, with two porcelain vases made by the Greenwood Pottery, about which Adrian will speak to you uh, momentarily as well. One area of the collection that is just beginning to grow uh, is that of arts and crafts metalwork of the early 20th century. We had almost nothing in this category, very, very few pieces. And here again, friends and supporters have come forward to help us out. Displayed in what I think is a real knockout case are examples of arts and crafts silver on loan from Margot Grant Walsh, who has a, a, tre a tremendous collection of this material, um, as well as three pieces that she surprised us with as gifts. Uh, and now have become uh, acquisitions. Loans and gifts from our devoted friends Jackie Fowler, such as this um, enameled and silver box by Elizabeth Copeland and Dee Dee Wigmore, the Heinrich um, uh, copper cha chafing dish are also on view in this case. And I think I have a view from the other side, yes. It's all very exciting because we, we haven't been able to show this moment in American um, uh, production. 
And one of the newest developments about which I am particularly delighted is the inclusion of American jewelry, which has also never been shown before in our permanent displays. We now have two cases of jewelry on the balcony, anchoring each end of the west balcony, and uh, offering a, a, a wonderful overview, I think, of uh, jewelry made or owned in America beginning in the early 18th century and extending into um, well into the 20th century. Several new acquisitions are included. Uh, I know it's very hard to see in this case, but find your way here, and there's a wonderful um, necklace by George W. Schiebler of coins, of uh, looking like antique coins, um, and the bracelet beneath it, all, both gifts, recent gifts from Martha Fleischmann. And here in the other case, uh, which includes Art Nouveau, Revival Styles, and Arts and Crafts Jewelry, there are two very special loans on top um, from Tiffany and Company of, uh, absolutely amazing enameled orchids, breathtaking in their uh, naturalism and the technical virtuosity. Now, you've reached the um, northwest end of the balcony, and if you walk just over here, uh, you will, will go down a glass staircase, leading to another brand new feature, which of course is the mezzanine balcony below, where you will find the extraordinary collection of American art pottery now displayed, this superb collection about which you might have read in the press, approximately 250 objects, and is now the promised gift of collector Robert A. Ellison, Jr. Um, and this will be discussed by Adrian uh, later this afternoon. You will not want to miss um, this balcony or Adrian's lecture um, either. So this and much, much more await you on the balconies of the American Wing. Uh, in the Engelhardt Court. We have had a wonderful time producing it. We hope that you will enjoy it. Come soon, come often, bring your friends, and um, uh, enjoy the thousand objects, small decorative arts objects that await you there. Thank you very much.